Thank you for viewing this talk. I'm a joint replacement surgeon in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'd like to present a quick background of component placement and total hip arthroplasty and discuss options for use intraoperatively during specifically anterior approach total hip arthroplasty. And I'd like to present a very simple overlay that I use. I'm going to go over pre-op templating and intraoperative options for perfecting limb length, offset, and component placement in anterior approach total hip arthroplasty. I'll then review how I use my simple overlay. If you'd like to skip the background that is familiar to most arthroplasty surgeons, the discussion of the overlay starts about halfway through the talk. The overlay can be downloaded from my practice website, and for about 50 cents, the document can be printed on a clear plastic sheet or brought to a copy store and be made. Just go to my staff page on the Jordan Young Institute website. The goal of hip replacement from a component position standpoint is to place parts that recreate the patient's limb length and offset and place components in optimal geometry to aid range of motion, prevent dislocation, and provide optimal biomechanics to minimize wear. Anterior approach arthroplasty allows for supine positioning and intraoperative fluoroscopy. Real-time imaging allows verification of appropriate implant position and recreation of anatomy according to the preoperative plan. Preoperatively, I like to ask the patient how their leg lengths feel to them and correlate that with my clinical and radiographic findings. When these things are discordant, I search for the reason. Clinically, I test the level of the medial malleoli in the supine position with the pelvis level and stable. I rarely use blocks. Radiographically, an AP pelvis x-ray is reviewed to determine the difference. I'll review how I do that later. There is debate regarding whether that x-ray should be in the supine or standing position. The pelvis changes in these positions such that it reclines from supine to standing, increasing acetabular or cup antiversion. But for limb length determination, the symmetry is what matters, and this measurement should not be affected. This is a different topic, but the thing that matters between those positions is how the cup version is determined intraoperatively and how the AP pelvis fluoroscopic image is recreated. I will discuss this later as well. Offset is really recreated by appropriate preoperative templating and intraoperative trialing. The preoperative x-ray should place the femurs in symmetric neutral abduction and the limbs should be internally rotated to view the femurs and fos. This internal rotation compensates for the natural femoral antiversion which places the neck out of the plane of the shaft. If the limb is externally rotated, this causes the neck shaft angle to appear in more relative valgus. Preoperative templing of the contralateral hip is often required because in severe hip OA, obligate fixed hip external rotation is common. Preoperative templating allows for recreation of the anatomy and intraoperative imaging in the supine patient confirms appropriate offset has been recreated. In the picture here, the patient's obligate external rotation on the right makes templating difficult and the contralateral side can be used. I currently template on standard software. I'll take you through my standard sequence and show you what I bring to the operating room to help me get things right. I start with the supine low AP pelvis and frog lateral hip x-rays, ensuring appropriate abduction and internal rotation as allowable. I look at the lateral for the presence of osteophytes and any abnormal proximal femoral anatomy. On the AP, I look at my acetabular anatomy, including osteophytes, distance to Kohler's line, presence of any osteolytic lesions, as well as any femoral head migration. I look at the radiographic limb length discrepancy and correlate that with my clinical findings. I think the inter-teardrop line is easier and more reliable to measure this parameter. I then like to lower the inter-teardrop line down to get the transischial line. I think this more accurately takes any rotational issues of the pelvis out. With pelvic rotation, you will often see the inferior rami width to be asymmetric. In this instance, the true transischial line should not end up at the inferior border of the bone. It should transect one partially. You will see this when you drop the inner drop line down on a rotated pelvis on occasion, and it makes more sense that this is more accurate. This transischial image I like to see in the operating room. I can use this to quickly get an idea of where my line should be going through the, at the femur if I have reestablished length. In this case, the line transects the contralateral hip at the inferior lesser trochanter. If I trial on this as close, I cannot be too far off in recreating limb length. I also like this image because it does not obscure the relevant anatomy I like to see in the OR. The template films obscure anatomy, but this image allows one to see the pertinent bony anatomy very well. Next, I use the standard templates to plan implants. In a case like this, the contralateral hip helps determine the likely stem geometry and size that will recreate the native hip. Desired changes to limb length and offset are taken into account. 
In the operating room, fluoroscopy can be used for any steps desired. I do not often use it to view my planned neck resection, but this can certainly easily be done, and this is a good idea if there is ever any doubt as to the location of the cut. I do routinely use fluoroscopy for final reaming and cup placement. I then use the unit for trialing. Occasionally, it is used during femoral prep to ensure appropriate broaching. Here's what I bring to the OR. This is the same patient from previous who is now undergoing contralateral total lip arthroplasty. I perform an anterior approach using a specialized traction table. The patient should be positioned on the table such that the pelvis is as symmetric as possible in all planes. The fluoroscopic image can be rotated, but it is easier to start with the patient in the best position prior to skin prep in order to minimize this, as it takes time and adds confusion. I do this by standing at the foot of the bed and making sure the patient is centered and collinear with the bed. Then, because most patients become hyper hyperlordotic on the traction table, I lift the pelvis and allow it to rest in as little lordosis as possible. This is confirmed with the AP fluoro x-ray prior to prep. The lordosis can be manually changed to an extent or the unit can be rainbowed to approximate the preoperative AP pelvis. The spars can also be lifted to flex the hips, allowing some relief of lordosis, but I have not found this particularly useful. This case is a good example of how templating helps, but putting it all together under live fluoroscopy is really the powerful way that these parameters can be perfected. On the initial side, I ended up with a bigger cup and stem than the template. This happens frequently with obese patients when the template ball is not positioned exactly at the level of the pelvis on pre-op films. With this change and opting for a 36 head, I was able to equalize limb lengths using intraoperative fluoro. Here are some fluoro sequence shots. The final reamer in place and then the cup in place. Here's where I think the difference between the supine and standing pre-op AP pelvis x-ray difference is negligible. I like to match the patient's native version and ensure that I keep the anterior rim of the cup covered so that they do not develop iliopsoas impingement. This is a real phenomenon and it is very uncomfortable for the patient without an easy solution. I like to feel my anterior and posterior acetabular rims and keep the cup confluent with those in order to match their version. To do this, you have to not be fooled by osteophytes or wall deficiencies if present. I then trial. I'll go over now different trialing options and then talk about my sequence and overlay. Here are some options for perfecting component positioning. I have used most of these methods to date, and here are some thoughts about these options. With fluoroscopy alone, we can grossly compare sides. The relative distance of the femur from the lateral ischium gives a very good gross indicator of offset, and the distal distance to the lesser trochanter gives a reasonable estimate of length, but this method is not accurate enough. Rulers can be used to measure these distances on the fluoroscopy screen. This is reasonable but cumbersome and prone to some error in measurement. Images can be printed preoperatively or intraoperatively for comparison and overlaid to determine changes. One thing that makes this impossible if trying to use a preoperative image is changing the height of the table or fluoro unit because of magnification changes. I have, for better or worse, been most comfortable with the table higher for acetabular prep and a little lower for femoral prep. This makes this not work well. Also, I have some concerns about sterility when required to change gloves, draw, and walk across the room. Otherwise, this is an accurate way to do this and is purported by many to work well. A grid has been described for use to place under the patient to work similar to an overlay. To me, this seems to obscure some bony anatomy and requires that the patient be placed correct correctly relative to the grid. I don't see a big advantage of this over an overlay. Computer navigation and software are expensive and can be cumbersome and time consuming. I don't currently think they add much to fluoro aided anterior approach hip arthroplasty. I now prefer use of an overlay that I'll show you. Here's the overlay I currently use. It's a simple grid that references landmarks on the hemipelvis to measure limb length and offset. The left side is labeled and the clear plastic sheet is reversed for the right side. It can be printed on clear plastic for about 50 cents. I'll go through a case and then go over some of the specifics. This is a pretty challenging anterior approach hip. This is a very small framed obese young female with bilateral hip AVN. I had previously done her left hip and we now plan the right. I don't think you need to get x-rays prior to prep in all cases. I do currently because it helps my text to mark the floor in the appropriate position for intraop images, but with more experienced text I don't think this is necessary. I have them mark their position on the floor for the AP pelvis image and make sure that they can just translate their boom either direction to obtain AP images of each hip without moving the machine.
This image needs to be rotated counterclockwise to obtain a level pelvis. I discussed the inlet and outlet positioning previously. I don't sweat too much a small difference in this dimension to my preoperative film because I use the acetabular rims to match version and I manually try to take lordosis out of the pelvis prior to skin prep. This little maneuver almost always allows this image to look similar to the pre-op supine image I obtain. If it is markedly different, I do rainbow the unit as needed, but again, hardly ever do so. After rotating this image appropriately, if desired, a long line on the overlay can be used to determine relative limb length differences. Symmetric limb abduction is required for this. I next get an AP hip to ensure the tech knows that I want to see the hip joint centered with a symphysis visible for each of the hemipelvis views. Again, I don't think this is necessary with more experienced techs, but with less experienced techs, I do think this is helpful in order to get their bearings for shooting the x-ray images. Here's the grid used with the reamer in place. For this purpose, only the 40 degree angle is pertinent. Based on my fluoro size, I've put that angle at a location that should be close to the edge of the cup for most patients, but this varies a bit. With the short vertical line at the symphysis and the major horizontal line through the base of the teardrop, the abduction angle can be determined and matched to the angled line. And here to the right, similarly with the cup in place. Again, the version I like to match to the patient. I want to see that the cup is grossly anteverted with anterior and posterior rims visible. Grossly, I know that this relationship is anteversion and not retroversion, along with the fact that it is difficult to try to retrovert a cup via the anterior approach. I don't think ellipses help me decide this. The phenomenon of parallax should be kept in mind. The object viewed must be in the center of the image to get a true representation of its value, position, or angle. Just as when an odometer gets viewed from the side and the speed is noted incorrectly, things need to be seen head-on to be accurate. Here's how the overlay can be used for trialing. It is nice in a small patient to be able to get this full AP image visualizing both lesser trochanters. As long as the hips are in symmetric abduction, a long horizontal line provides a quick check to know that the limb length is in the ballpark. Here's how this overlay works for the hemipelvis view. The short vertical line is placed at the symphysis. The major horizontal line goes through the inferior aspect of the teardrop. This orients the overlay. Limb length and offset can then be read off of the short horizontal and long vertical lines respectively. These are absolute measurements on the overlay. Distance away from the major horizontal or short vertical lines in millimeters and each block on the grid is 5 by 5 millimeters. But because the image is not scale, these values are arbitrary. I'll show you a rough way to scale this if desired next. So in this image, the mid lesser trochanter is right at the 50 millimeter mark and the offset is 140 minus about 15 for 125. If desired, these numbers can be written on the overlay grid. Again, neutral limb abduction and at least reasonable rotation are crucial to make this work. It should be noted that not all symphyses are linear and parallel to the midline. This can usually be noted on the patient's pre-op pelvis films and taken into account intraoperatively. Here's the contralateral hip showing similar measurements. A 25 millimeter template ball can be taped or however placed in a location at the level of the pelvis during the procedure. This can be referenced on the 25 by 25 millimeter grid on the overlay. This is not exact, I rarely use it, but when I have the ball is actually consistently measured very close to 25 millimeters on the grid. If not, this can be factored in such that a difference of say 5 millimeters between sides and limb length, if the ball is measuring much smaller than 25 millimeters, would signify a larger difference and vice versa. Here is this young female after bilateral total hip orthoplasty. Here are some of the fine points related to use of the overlay. It is not foolproof. Just as in, as in any other measurement system, there is room for error. Pelvic rotation must be taken into account during overlay use. It is okay to be slightly rotated, but this must be understood by the person using the overlay and taken into account. As I discussed previously, I like to get as neutral rotation as possible preoperatively to remove this variable as much as possible. Also, the pelvis can be hemi-elevated in the coronal plane. If the patient has some asymmetric bedding under the buttocks, one hemi-pelvis can be elevated. This essentially throws magnification off and makes side-to-side -side comparison impossible. This can most easily be visualized by asymmetric appearance of the inferior pubic rami.
When one ramus is very large and another small, they are not in the same plane. This needs to be corrected by moving the patient or rainbowing the floral unit. Similarly, limb adduction must be symmetric to compare both parameters of limb length and offset. It is not uncommonly the case that the patient with large thighs cannot be adducted symmetrically. And in this case, single AP views of the operative and non-operative hip are obtained and the person running the table needs to move the non-imaged leg out of the way to adduct the visualized leg appropriately. The overlay user is not the surgeon, and it is important that they understand the radiographic anatomy. If the teardrop location is not placed appropriately or other variation occurs, the comparison will be off. It's important for the surgeon to verify that the overlay user has their landmarks placed appropriately and symmetrically. Also remember, when comparing side-to-side -side single hip images, the table or floral unit height cannot be changed due to relative changes to the magnification. This especially needs to be known by the x-ray tech as they often want to change the height to get over retractors. Lastly, you may need to alter the relative location of some of the lines on the overlay to best suit your specific floral unit, such that the angle of the cup sits close to the inferior cup border and that with the average patient you find the offset and length major lines close to the desired position. You could make changes on the Word document prior to printing and tailor your overlay as needed. Thank you for viewing this talk. I hope you found it helpful. Again, the overlay can be found for use on the noted website on my staff page and easily printed on clear plastic.